Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, I'd lo also uh, like to say it's a, it's a privilege and honor and a pleasure for me to give this lecture uh, to the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. So I'm grateful that I was uh, invited. And uh, I'll start by wishing you uh, congratulations uh, for on your 100th anniversary and uh, up for the 200th. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, paving a more sustainable future. The, what are the, is this the, yeah, okay. Oh, that's the laser, okay. This is forward, that's backwards. Okay, oh yeah, okay. Now we've got the technology <laughs> sorted out. Uh, yeah, to tell you about uh, <clears throat> more sustainable for future through uh, green chemistry and catalysis. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, yeah? Okay, good. Uh, this is how I've, my, how I've divided my talk. Uh, I first want to say something about green chemistry and catalysis, give you some definitions, uh, and then talk about sustainability and the circular economy. And then I want to move to the bio-based economy, which is something which, uh, which uh, really interests me. And uh, then I'll finish with some conclusions and some final thoughts. Uh, first of all, oh, I'll get, oh, well, start with the definition of green chemistry uh, so we can get everybody on the same page. Uh, it really <clears throat> consists of uh, three different aspects. First is, uh, it's, if it's chemistry that efficiently utilizes, preferably renewable, <coughs> sorry, renewable raw materials, uh, and that is included in the energy sources that you need. And it eliminates waste and avoids the use of toxic and hazardous solvents and reagents in, in the manufacture and application of chemicals. So we should remember it's not just the manufacturer, but the chemicals themselves that you are making, they need to be green. There's no point in developing a green process to make something which is not green. So we're talking about waste prevention, not waste management, not waste, not end of pipe remediation of waste. We want to avoid waste in the first place, and then we don't have to remediate it. <clears throat> and I want to refer you to, to these two texts for more details on these definitions. Uh, the book that I have written together with two of my co-workers, uh, Ahrens and Hanefeld, on green chemistry and catalysis, and the book uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, edited by Anastas and Warner on green chemistry theory and practice. And uh, this is the book, Green Chemistry and Catalysis, so that's what you should read. Uh, <clears throat> do politicians understand the issues? Uh, I would say, in, generally speaking, no. They don't understand the issues. And I think this is a rather telling quote from Dan Quayle. Who remembers who Dan Quayle was? Uh, uh, well, quite a few people in the audience. He was the vice president uh, under George W. Bush Sr. And in the period 1989 to 1993, this was when green chemistry was just coming up and when people were starting to pay attention to, uh, to waste and pollution. And let's look at what Dan Quayle said. Yeah, it's not pollution that's the problem, it's the impurities in our air and water. <laughs> so <coughs> politicians, <clears throat> Awfully, obviously need educating. Uh, now I want to take you back to the beginning of the, of the, the chemical industry. And 1856 is a very important year. In that year, William Henry Perkin, and how, how are there any students in the audience? No, they've all got better things to do, of course. Uh, <coughs> If there were students in the audience, I would tell them an important point here. 
William Henry Perkin was 18 years old when he did this work. And his professor was, uh, <coughs> was uh, von, Hof von Hoffmann, uh, a German chemist who was professor at the Royal, uh, Royal College of Chemistry in London. And uh, probably, probably Hoffmann said to the young Perkin, why don't you make quinine? Wouldn't that be a good idea? And so Perkin said, okay, I'll go in the lab and make quinine. And, and he said, look, here's the formula. It's C20, H24, N2O2. And so Perkin, only 18, remember, he said, well, I think I'll take allyl toluidine, which is a component of coal tar, waste product from the steel making industry, and I'll, <coughs> I'll oxidize, oxidize it with potassium dichromate. And that should go like this and get a quinine and a molecule of water. So that's what he did. Unfortunately, neither <coughs> von Hoffmann or per Perkin knew that the structure of quinine was looking like this. And so the chance that he would, they would make it was zero. But yeah, they didn't know this. And, of course, Perkin didn't make any quinine. But Perkin was a, a very clever young man. He saw that in the flask there were purple crystals. And he knew at that time, in 1856, the color Tyrian purple cost more per kilogram than gold. And so he was not only a good scientist, Perkin, he was, he was a good businessman. He patented the, this, he patented the, the preparation of movine, it became known, or aniline purple, and that's roughly the color that it had. He patented it, and within one year, he had built a plant to make uh, ton quantities of this material. <coughs> an 18-year-old student. <coughs> there he is. He's a bit more than 18 there, but uh, this was when he was a grand old man of chemistry. <coughs> so this was actually the beginning of the fine chemical industry. <coughs> uh, based on waste from the steel-making industry, coal tar. And actually, the, the current fine chemicals and pharmaceutical industry all evolved from this beginning. And so it's rather ironic that the pharmaceutical industry, which made quinine eventually, uh, well, or, or found out what the structure was and isolated it, uh, that, that, that came out of, the pharmaceutical industry came out of this work of Perkin. And remember that, what he used to, to oxidize the allyl toluidine, he used potassium dichromate in 1856. Now I'm going to go fast forward to around about 1980 when I was working for a company which, which later became part of DSM. I was the CTO of this company, although the, the, the title CTO, CTO didn't exist then. I was head of the R&D. And this company was the world's largest producer of this uh, compound here, fluorolucinol, which was a pharmaceutical intermediate, among other things. We made hundreds of tons of this product in a year. And I'm going to show you now, I won't show you the details because there are a lot of people who aren't chemists here, <coughs> but it was the starting material should say something to you, trinitrotoluene a high expl highly explosive material. That was our starting material. And uh, we did this in the middle of a city in the south of Holland, Fenlo. We had a bunker there where we stored hundreds of tons of TNT. This all was, was all possible in 1980. And we're only talking about 30 years ago. This would be absolutely impossible today to do this. <coughs> Uh, but it was all absolutely legal back in those days. All, I think most people who lived in Fedlow didn't know that we had all those tons of TNT in the bunker. So 
Now, I don't know if there are any organic chemists in the audience. Probably not. Probably I'm the only organic chemist here. Any organic chemists? Yes, one there. Well, what would an organic chemist say about this process? Three steps, product in more than 90% yield. Would you say that is an efficient process, a selective process? I think most, certainly in 1980, most organic chemists would have said that. And I think a lot of organic chemists would say today that that is a, a, an efficient process without thinking about other things maybe. Because if we look at what also goes into that reactor, we see potassium dichromate, familiar from Perkin, 1856. <coughs> potassium dichromate, fuming sulfuric acid, and then in one of the later steps, uh, iron and hydrochloric acid. And out of the other end comes then uh, the, these, all, all this inorganic material. Organic chemists don't pay any attention to this because it's all inorganic. <coughs> uh, but now it's not starting to look so efficient, is it? And if we then look at that, this process produced 40 kilograms of chromium-containing waste per kilogram of fluorodeleucinol. And I'm sure that even the non-chemists in the audience know about the carcinogenic properties of chromium-6. It's a highly carcinogenic material. <coughs> So this is what we were producing back then. Uh, I can tell you an interesting story very, very quickly. What we did with this waste back in, you know, what do you think we did with 40 kilograms of waste per kilogram of product back in 19, early 1980s? I'll tell you, we, well, it, it was obtained as an, as an aqueous solution. So we, we evaporated all the water and we got 40 grams of solid cake. And that was, essentially put in big bags on the back of trucks and driven to the East German border uh, where we paid the East Germans to take it off our hands. And this was a completely legal way in the 1980s, early 1980s of getting rid of your uh, waste in uh, Western Europe. We just uh, paid the Eastern Europeans to take it off our hands. <coughs> Obviously, this is not an option these days. <coughs> What is the conclusion from what I've just told you? The conclusion is a new paradigm was needed for efficiency in organic synthesis. <clears throat> from the traditional one based on chemical yield to one that assigns value to waste elimination and avoids the use of toxic and hazardous materials. Because in this process, we're, we're we're using a high explosive as starting material. We're using a carcinogenic material as, as our, our reagent. And we're making 40 kilograms of waste per, per kilogram of product. This, this sort of fits with all, everything I said about green chemistry. It's everything that it shouldn't be. <clears throat> so what is missing? An environmental factor was missing in the equation. And it, because it was missing, I invented it. So I invented the E factor. And a good quote here is from Lord Kelvin, to measure is to know. <coughs> of course, most people must have known that they were producing all this waste and didn't they think that you know, that was not so good. But they were sort of never, never looking at numbers. So, in 1992, I published this table of e-factors from the chemical industry because I was working in the chemical industry and I had access to data in a lot of processes. So, what I did was to calculate the e-factor of processes in the fine chemical industry, pharmaceutical intermediates, in bulk chemicals, because DSM was making bulk chemicals, and oil refining, I knew from when I worked for Shell. And I came up with this table, and as you can see, as you go downstream in the chemical industry, the amount of waste you're producing per kilogram of product is 
quite substantial. So 40 kilograms per kilogram of, of uh, product was not unusual for the fine chemical industry, and it could even be on the low side for the pharmaceutical industry, where 100 kilograms of waste per kilogram of product is certainly not unusual. So just think about that for a few seconds. All this waste you're making. And what, so what is my definition of waste? It's everything but the, uh, uh, the product you're trying to, me to make. The ideal, the ideal E factor is zero. I also introduced a second term, atom utilization, where I said, look, the problem is all these atoms that are going into that reactor, they have to end up in the product. <coughs> and so I uh, coined this term atom, util <coughs> atom utilization, mass of desired product over total mass of products. And the ideal, e the ideal atom utilization is 100%. Now, Barry Trost published shortly after this his, his wonderful paper on atom economy. And so everybody refers to this as atom economy and nobody calls it atom utilization. Anyway. And I call it atom economy as well. <coughs> uh, so now the question is, where is all this waste coming from? It's coming from stoichiometric reagents and solvents. We've seen that. <coughs> We've seen that in that fluorolucinol process and from in the pharmaceutical industry, of course, you're making complicated molecules like quinine and a lot more complicated, and you need multi-step processes. And the more steps you use, the, the, the probability that you make more waste is, is high, of course. So if that is the problem, what is the solution? The solution is obvious. What we need are atom and step economic processes with low E-factors. Because don't forget, the definition of a catalyst is it accelerates the rate of a reaction without being consumed. In theory, in practice, it's not perfect, nothing's perfect, but, but that, what this means is, in theory, there is no waste in a catalytic process if all you're using is that, is that catalyst and air or whatever. <coughs> now, <coughs> Just to complete the picture, what about today? What are we, what are we, what are we doing today? Uh, what are we teaching students? Uh, if I said to a student, uh, if I put it on an, I put a, an exam question, how would you oxidize a, an alcohol to a ketone, secondary alcohol to a ketone? And I could, uh, and I, whenever I gave uh, exams, they're all open book exams. They could take any book in there that they wanted and look it up. I don't care because it's understanding that is the, <coughs> the point, not, not knowledge, but understanding. But they, were, they could take, take a textbook that is being used today, worldwide, open it, look in the index, how to oxidize an alcohol to a ketone. And I can tell you what they will find. It will say, Use the Jones reagent. Sounds like something uh, innocuous, the Jones reagent, until you realize that the Jones reagent is nothing more than chromium trioxide in sulfuric acid. We're still teaching this to students, that this is how you oxidize an alcohol to a ketone in 2016. It has an atom economy of 44%. The E factor is more than three. So let me give you another quote. Huh? It's hexavalent chromium, highly toxic, highly carcinogenic, gets into your DNA so you pass the trouble along to your kids. Julia Roberts in Erin Brockovich. Erin Brockovich. Anybody seen that film? A great film. What is this film about? You know, if you were paying attention and not just watching Julia Roberts, you would know that the, the film is about chromium waste. That's what the film is about. So what we need is a green alternative to this sort of, uh, of uh, method to oxidize. And the green alternative is to use oxygen or air and a catalyst, and preferably no solvent or water as a solvent, 
and then we have an atom economy of 91%. The only byproduct is water, and if we don't count the water, it has an E factor of essentially zero. And here is an example which uh, I published back in 2000. Uh, <coughs> this shows a way of doing this. With a, a palladium complex in catalytic quantities dissolved in water, it oxidizes the, the uh, alcohol with air to the ketone, and if the, if the alcohol and the ketone are insoluble in water, then they will just float on top and you can just tap off the ketone when the reaction is finished. The catalyst can be recycled. There's no organic solvent. solvent. So this is a green way to make an alcohol, to make a ketone from an alcohol. Another way is to use a, a, a biocatalytic method, use an enzyme. You can do uh, the enzyme lacase catalyzes the oxidation of, uh, of tempo, which is the free radical form from this, to the oxoammonium cation. That oxidizes your alcohol to an aldehyde, and so we have a catalytic system here, which the important component <coughs> is the enzyme, which is working with air. So overall, we're just making water as a byproduct. Okay, <coughs> so that's green chemistry and catalysis. What about sustainability? Sustainable development meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the needs of future generations. What this means is that everything we are using, we are borrowing from our children and grandchildren and their children and grandchildren. And we, we're borrowing it. We're not, we're not allowed to use it and not give it back. So we have, we have got to return <coughs> what we're using. In practice, what this means is natural resources should not be used, should be, should be used at rates that do not unacceptably deplete supplies over the longer term. <coughs> so <coughs> it's a rate, it's a matter of rate. <coughs> and obviously, oh sorry, obviously fossil resources fall into this category. They are being used at a at a rate that, uh, that we can't keep up. And uh, we need to replace that with renewable biomass. And another point is residues should be generated at rates no higher than can be assimilated by the natural environment. And this is where greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, climate change all fall into. They are a result of the fact that we are, we are producing waste in the form of CO2 at a rate that the environment can't cope with. <coughs> this is another way of looking at uh, sustainability. It's a Fenn diagram. It's all of these, all three of the components are important, environmental, economic, and social. And where they all meet, that is sustainability. To be sustainable, it has to be good in all three, it good, score well in all three points. So let me take you to the petro petrochemical carbon cycle now. Take a look at this cycle. This is what, what is happening. So we, uh, sunlight is, be is being converted via photosynthesis to plant biomass, which is via geological processes being converted in geolog geological reservoirs to oil, and the oil is converted in an oil re refinery to fuels and chemicals which are combusted or uh, <coughs> do something else with them and they end up as CO2 in the end. <coughs> uh, CO2 and that goes, then it just goes round. So you could say, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? This is, this is a circular economy. What's wrong is the rate. Remember what I said? The rate. The rate of this process is taking millions or hundreds of millions of years, and this process is taking uh, tens uh, of years or hundreds of years. So they're completely out of phase. And what we need is to balance the carbon cycle <coughs> and uh, by converting that plant biomass directly in a biorefinery to sugars which can be converted to fuels and chemicals. Now, if we don't put any, any other type of energy in, in this system, then this is a, this is a, a, a carbon neutral system.
This is a real circular economy. But what we need for all of these processes are catalysts. And it has to be green chemistry, of course. And so what we need are both chemo and biocatharsis. <clears throat> Just something about the linear versus the circular economy. The problem with our economy worldwide is it's linear. It's take, make, use, dispose. That's it. That's what we're doing, what we've been doing for the last 150 years. And this is not sustainable. <clears throat> a linear economy is not sustainable. We, what we need is a circular economy that is, oh, sorry, a, a circular economy that is resource efficient by design. And this will result in a greening of the economy. <clears throat> now, and here's the problem. And in, in Europe, there is, uh, Europe, the EU has decided that we have to introduce a, uh, a circular economy. But there is a lot of opposition. <clears throat> and the big problem is, that, of course, the economic one. And the problem is that the two systems are not being compared on a level playing field. <clears throat> because in the linear system, there are a lot of external costs which are not included and so then it looks better the economics look better than for a circular economy but if one internalizes the external costs of the linear econ economy which are substantial <coughs> then the the circular economy becomes more economic than the linear economy and this is what the e eu is uh, and I'm part of a working party in the EU to come up with a way to do this. What we need are metrics. How, how are we going to measure it? So this is the circular economy. So by design, th this is the important message. Why are things different, difficult to recycle? They're not designed to be recycled. We need to design everything with recycling in mind. And that's, where it, so that's why it says here, design. So then manufacture, distribution, consumption, and then collection and recycling. There will always be some residual waste, of course. Nothing is perfect. <coughs> and uh, so we just keep going around in a circular economy. We're not using up the raw materials. So, you can divide people into two groups. Those that divide everything into two groups and those that don't. Uh, this is a quote from Kenneth Balding, the British-American economist and philosopher. So we're going to talk about the two catalysts, uh, catalysis uh, groups, chemocatalysis and biocatalysis. I'm these days more interested in the biocatalysis side. We'll be concentrating much more on that. But what we need are clean, green, biocatalytic processes or catalytic processes to convert renewable biomass to chemicals, fuels, and, and biomaterials. Now, here's an important point. But this depends where you are in the world. In... in the EU, the decision is being made, that decision can't be reversed, that it can't involve competition with food. That, that is no, that's just impossible in the EU to do that. Now, and it can be indirectly with food, it's just land usage. But of course, you would laugh at this in Brazil because you have all this land mass. So here it's different, but in, the EU, we don't have a large landmass for all those people. So in the EU, the, the, the word is, the key word is waste. We have got to make things from waste. Then there's no competition with food. Now just take a look at this table. Here it gives you some feeling for the sort of waste that's going around in this world. Huh? Rice straw, 
730 million tons a year. Wheat straw, 354. Sugar cane, bagas. That's something you, you know about in Brazil, of course. Uh, uh, that is uh, 180 t million tons. And this is just a fraction of, of, of all the waste, of course. But these are important parts. This is agricultural waste. I'm not even talking about forestry waste here. <clears throat> so what we now see is that we're... On the one hand, we're saying we don't want to produce waste in, in the green, uh, with green chemistry and the circular economy, but we've got to accept that in some th things like forestry and, and uh, agriculture, it is impossible to completely avoid waste, so we've got to use that waste. And <coughs> we, uh, we, talk of, we used to talk about utilization, but that, that's not, you know, it doesn't... It doesn't uh, say that you're making money from it, that there is, is an economic benefit. So what we need to do is valorization. That means we're adding value to that waste. And I remember this, uh, this, when, I, when we wrote this paper for science, this paper here, together, I wrote together with Polly Akoff and, uh, and, and Horvath and others, then I, I put uh, valorization in the... Uh, in the title, this is back, it's not only in 2012, and one of the authors, I won't say which one, he said, Roger, we can't have valorization in the title because nobody understands what valorization is. So I said, yeah, maybe not today, but mark my words, in five years' time, everybody will be talking about valorization, and when they Google, what, what, which paper are they gonna find? This one. <laughs> and I was right, no? Huh? Everybody's talking about valorization now. <clears throat> oh, and, of course, look at the, these are the top three petrochemicals. They're also uh, 100 million tons, a uh, couple of hundred million tons. So, yeah, the amount of waste we, we could produce virtually the whole chemical industry just from waste. And this is my waste valorization scale. So if we've got waste, what are we going to do with it? I can tell you what they do with it in a lot of countries. Uh, and that is, they bury it. You know, in, there are some countries that that's the only thing they do with waste. They bury it and forget it. That's the worst thing you could do with waste. It actually costs money to do that. And it's not very environmentally friendly. Then electricity generation, which uh, you do in Brazil from bagasse, of course, is, is something positive to do with waste. But there are a lot better things you could do with it. Animal feed is, is even probably a bit better than electricity generally, but there are only so many animals you can feed, of course. Uh, fermentation feedstock is not bad. Transportation fuel, okay. But of course, the best thing you can do with it is convert it to chemicals. They have the highest value. <coughs> so really, convert all the, all the waste into chemicals. Uh, and so this was what, 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 what we would be doing in a... Uh, in a lignocellulosic biorefinery. Because now I'm just talking as somebody from the EU. So if we're talking about a biorefinery, it has to be with lignocellulose. And so we can convert that, either we can gasify it or we can pyrolyze it. But what I'm gonna be talking about now is this rather sophisticated way of, of doing it with, with enzymes, catalyzing the hydrolysis to uh, cellulose and hemicellulose uh, uh, in a pretreatment, and then with enzymes, converting these to, uh, to sugars. And then we can convert the sugars to products via chemocatalytic or biocatalytic methods. Uh, or the, uh, these can be converted by standard methods to, uh, uh, to pe standard petrochemicals. An interesting, uh, something what is uh, quite a hot item at the moment is uh, is taking the uh, syngas and fermenting it. You can make the same products that you make from glucose. And here you could use the syngas, and it sort of <laughs> reminds you of, uh, of um, Perkin. You could take syngas, which is a byproduct of steel making, and convert it via fermentation to, uh, to chemicals. So uh, there are two philosophies in, in this, and that is, one is, Convert the biomass to drop in petrochemical hydrocarbons and then you do the rest the same as what, we're, what we've always been doing from oil. 
or you could convert the biomass directly to platform chemicals, which is more redox efficient and probably a better way of going straight to oxygenates. Uh, so, well, we will probably see, see both. There's not one answer to everything. So let me talk, say something about uh, the uh, biocatalytic route. So in the EU, we will be taking waste lignocellulose, some sort of pretreatment to separate the lignin, and then converting this with, a, with an enzyme cocktail to, uh, to sugars, and then converting the sugars either by a chemo or biocatalysis to, uh, to biofuels and uh, chemicals and bioplastics. Uh, there are all sorts of technologies for doing this, and, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of companies and universities are, are doing research on, on this part. Uh, I'm more involved in, in the second part, the, uh, the hyd enzymatic hydrolysis. Uh, here we can see the, uh, what we're talking about here and with molecules. First generation uh, biofuels were made from sucrose, uh, here, uh, which was, would be sugar cane here in uh, Brazil or in Europe would be sugar beet, or starch. Uh, and, uh, but, but this is what we don't want in the EU, to make biofuels from these starting materials. We want to make it from waste, which is uh, lignocellulose containing cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. So we separate the lignin, and then with enzymes, we are converting those, those uh, 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 polysaccharides to, uh, to glucose and other, other carbohydrates, and then ferment this to get ethanol. And this is what is being done. If we look what's happening worldwide in uh, this area over the, over the last years, then we can see big rise in the production of, of bioethanol as a fuel. And you can see it was mainly in Brazil in the beginning until the Americans got involved in making uh, bioethanol from starch. And here we can see this is, that's from sugar, that's from corn, corn starch. And you can see that, uh, that they, they have taken over as the world's largest producer of bioethanol. You can see the numbers from 2013 here where it's USA by far the largest producer of bioethanol, then Brazil. You can see EU producing almost nothing. But the EU wants to increase this, but only via lignocellulosic ethanol. Now, once you've got ethanol, <coughs> you can not only use it as a fuel, you can convert it to other molecules. You, I mean, you can e e essentially make the whole, <coughs> whole chemical industry from ethanol. But it's not going to be economical to do all these molecules, but certainly there are some molecules that could probably be made uh, economically from ethanol. Now, I just want to say something about biocatalysis. Why biocatalysis is green? <coughs> and the first point and the second point are very, very important. Enzymes are derived from renewable raw materials. So we don't have to worry about where we're going to get the enzymes from in, in uh, the future because they're made from biomass and biomass is always going to be there. And enzymes will, in the future, just get cheaper and cheaper. But <clears throat> if we talk, think about noble metals, then that is not the case. <clears throat> that, uh, and, of course, we don't have uh, uh, noble metals. Their commercial, commercial availability in the, in the uh, future is, is questionable. And uh, we also don't have to worry about what is happening when, when the catalyst ends up, uh, when it ends its lifetime and it ends up in the environment, then that is no problem for an enzyme because it's, it's biodegradable. So it avoids the use of uh, or, and product contamination by scarce precious metals, which is becoming an issue in the, in the circular economy. And it has a lot of other, a lot of other attributes which are, make it a very desirable technology, higher quality products, less waste, more energy efficient, etc. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, a reduced environmental footprint. <clears throat> so some of you may, may be thinking, okay, Roger, if, if biocatalysis is so good, how come we haven't been using it for the last 50 years? 
because <laughs> biocatharsis was known 30, 30, 40, maybe even 50 years ago. So how come we haven't been using it then, if it's so good? Here are the reasons. <clears throat> it's, I tell those people, yeah, you just don't know what has happened in the last 10 to 20 years in biotechnology. What we have are the uh, genome sequences of more than 20,000 bacterial genomes. It means we know what that gene looks like. We know what the enzymes look like that are being produced by that organism. We don't need, we've never seen that enzyme, but just put it, feed, the, feed the sequence into the computer, and the computer will just say, oh, that's a, that's a lipase, or that's a protease. Uh, and then we know that that is there. Some, we, we know the, the, the organism that is making it, so we can get that enzyme. So there are more and more enzymes available. And directed evolution technologies are making better enzymes. And this has been a fantastic uh, development in biocatalysis. Now we can, we can optimize an enzyme to do what we want by directed evolution. Because that enzyme was produced over millions of years by evolution. And we can now do that same evolution in a test tube in a week. <coughs> Recombinant DNA technology allows us to produce enzymes for very low prices. And immobilization technologies, which I'll talk a bit, a, a bit about because that's one of my favorite subjects as well, allows for better formulations. So at the end of the day, lower costs and shorter time. What's the challenge? Enzymes are usually sold as, as, as uh, solutions in water. You get an aqueous solution, and so that's difficult to often to recover and recycle the enzyme. And what often happens is it's single use. So you're using the enzyme and then throwing it away. What this is is not nonsense, really. It's a catalyst. Why, why are you throwing it away? Uh, you're throwing it away because it's not easy to get back. <clears throat> so how to reduce the enzyme cost? Well, recycle it, and do this by making from that aqueous solution a, a solid powder that we can just get out of the reactor and recycle. And we invented in Delft, in my group, a method for doing that as cross-linked enzyme aggregates. And I'm going to tell a little bit about that now. And now you've got a heterogeneous catalyst which you put in your reactor. <clears throat> Basically, there are three ways of immobilizing an enzyme. You could put it onto a carrier, onto a support, or you could entrap it in a support, or you can cross-link it. And carrier-bound enzymes have one very big disadvantage, and that is it's almost all carrier and no enzyme. Sometimes you buy a, an immobilized enzyme on a carrier, and it's 99% carrier, which you're paying for, and 1% enzyme. You're paying more for the carrier than for the enzyme. And the carrier doesn't do anything, of course. Whereas in a clear, oh sorry, in a clear, then it's virtually all catalyst. There is no support. So this, how it works is we take, we take a solution of the enzyme, an aqueous buffer, we precipitate it by standard techniques like using ammonium sulfate, and we get a, uh, we get a precipitate. And that precipitate is just enzyme aggregates that are insoluble in water. If we took that precipitate and threw it into water, it would re-dissolve because there's, there's nothing preventing that. So what we do is to add a cross-linker, which cross-links the, the enzyme molecules and enzyme aggregates together by reacting with amino groups on the surface of the enzyme. And we get then a clear. That's a clear. Now, there's an, uh, we've got a, a variation on this theme, and that is we do that in the presence of magnetic nanoparticles. And we get then a, a magnetic, a ferromagnetic clear. And I'm going to come back to this because this is very important. Uh, it's simple, it's broadly applicable, it's cost effective because we don't need a a pure enzyme to do this, and it's readily scalable. And this company, Clear Technologies, is, uh, is or has commercialized this, this technology. 
and they sell these clears. Now let me go back then to that, that uh, am, how am I doing for time? Am I all right? Okay, good. Uh, waste biomass being converted by enzyme to, to glucose, which is then fermented to give bioethanol. Now, <clears throat> we have a process called SSF, and that stands for simultaneous saccharification and fermentation. This is saccharification, and this is fermentation. What we want to do is to do this in one pot, no isolation, so we're just taking our waste biomass and in one pot converting it to bioethanol. That, isn't that wonderful that you could do that? And that can be done. That's a SSF process. Okay. So you reduce enzyme costs. The, the enzyme costs are, are here. And the, this is not just in, in second generation biomass. This is not one enzyme. It's a cocktail of enzymes. And they're, they're used at this moment uh, in first generation and second generation bioethanol. They're all used on a throwaway basis, single-use basis. So they're using enzymes there. And, and I, I, I know that, that, that the enzyme bill, five, the enzyme bill for some of these uh, for some of these producers is millions of dollars, even though they're cheap enzymes. They're spending millions of dollars on the enzyme, which they're using once and then throwing away. So what we need to do is to, sorry, is to immobilize it and recycle it. But now we have a problem because there are a lot of suspended solids here. So we've got our immobilized enzyme, which is a solid. Right. I've got to speak here. <laughs> we've got our immobilized enzyme, which is a solid, and we've got other solids suspended in the reactor. How are we going to separate the two solids? Well, you already know the answer because I've shown you the answer. We do it magnetically. So we make a magnetic clear of these, this enzyme or enzyme cocktail, and then we can separate them magnetically. So here I can show you the, uh, <coughs> this is how we do it. Well, I told you how you do it. So we, so we make these, these ferromagnetic clears. And here you can see a, a, a small bottle. There's the, the, the solution of the, of the magnetic clear, put a, put a magnet next to it and everything, all, all, the, all the clear goes to the, uh, to the uh, magnet. Okay, I've shown this years ago to um, I could, peop, industrial people in the audience say, yeah, great Roger, but you know, how are you gonna do that on, on, a, on an industrial scale? You know, this is a little bottle there. How are you gonna do that on an industrial scale? And I thought that that was a big problem. <clears throat> Until we spoke to a company where we're doing uh, actually a first generation bioethanol project. And uh, uh, I said, you know, I've got a way to do this, but I don't think it's, it's commercially attractive. And the guy said to me, uh, why not, Roger? You can do magnetic separation on a very large scale. It's done every day in the mining industry. So I said, okay, and so we started thinking like that, and um, <clears throat> this is how it came, came uh, how we came to do it with these. So you've got a, uh, this is just on, a, on up to 1,000 liter scale. You've got a sheath here, and you put a magnet in that sheath, put that in your reactor, and everything goes, goes there. Then you take it out of the reactor and take it out of the sheath, and then you can just wash off the, uh, the, uh, the magnetic particles. Okay, that's a thousand liter. How are you going to do this on a million liter scale then? <coughs> Bioethanol SSF processes are done on, on several million liter scale. That's a building. The, re the fermenters are, uh, we, we, ha we have the customer that we're talking to here uh, that w that's looking at using this. They have 10 three million liter reactors, fermenters. Okay, now, there's just one, what, what, I want to try one thing here, and then I'm, I'm virtually finished. Uh, so, how do you do that on a million liter scale? Now, I practiced this, <laughs> and so I hope we can do this. We can show, yes, here, oh, it's working, yeah, good, good. How are we going to do this on a large scale? This is it, if you can get it, get the video rolling now. This is how you do it on a, on a really large scale. 
<coughs> so this is, there you can see It only takes one minute or so, this. Uh... <coughs> and the important thing is here, 10,000 liters per minute flow rate. So we could easily empty a, a, a couple of million liter fermenter in a reasonable time. <coughs> so there we're putting, we're putting these magnets into this this, that's it, you see the, the magnets are going in, the sh they're the sheaths, now the magnets go in the sheaths, then we close it, and now we put, we, so we're going to empty our fermenter, and it's going to go through there, and here it comes. Should be, yeah, there it comes. So, there are our magnetic particles, they're going through there, and they're, they're being uh, collected on those magnets. And what comes out after, well, they are, when, here you can see what's happening inside, inside there. They're being collected on those, and then they don't come through it. You see that here. They don't come through. So what comes out the other end is now clean, and all the magnetic particles are staying in there. And then at some point, we withdraw the magnets, and now we can just, we open another valve, and we wash off the magnetic particles, and then start, then start the next cycle. Isn't this wonderful that you can do this on, a, on any scale you want with these magnetic clears? Uh, now, I just got a couple of slides, and then, I, and then I'm finished. I just I thought I'd show this. I, I'd say something about biomaterials. What do you think this is? This is a, an American artist. He makes portraits of intolerable, intolerable beauty. Portraits of American mass consumption. Um, can, you, can you see what they are now? The two million plastic beverage bottles, the number used in the US every five minutes. Pet bottles. Look at them. <coughs> and what we need is to make this pet from renewable raw materials. And that's that's what this shows. I'm not going to go into the detail. And if, or make a different polymer with the same properties as PET, but which is, which is maybe even better than PET. And that is this PEF, which is, which is made from, from sugars, from it could be made from lignocellulose. And what about this? I thought this would appeal to Brazilians, a football boot made from from uh, castor oil-based uh, thermoplastic polyurethane. So I, th that's the thing I, saw. I just want to finish now with some conclusions. So I think green chemistry and catalysis are the key to resource efficiency. I hope you've convinced you of that. And that biocatalysis and waste valorization, that, that's what the bio-based economy is all about, on the way to a greener circular economy. And what we're going to need here is smart engineering to make this all economical. So smart engineering at the interface of chemistry and biology. For example, the use of magnetic clears in SSF processes for bioethanol. And this is, I, I would just finish with saying, the best is yet to come. And just a couple of final thoughts. We started with Perkin, the student of von Hoffmann. So I thought it would be good to finish with a quote from von Hoffmann. And this is a quote from von Hoffmann. In an ideal chemical factory, there is strictly speaking no waste but only products. The better a real factory makes use of its waste, the closer it gets to its ideal, the bigger the profit. He said it in... When did he say it doesn't give a date? So this is what we're talking about. This is what green chemistry is all about. And von, Hoff, von Hoffmann already said it back in the 19th century. But nobody listened to him, of course. And uh, this reminds me of something that the famous chemist uh, 
St. Georgi, who, who discovered vitamin C, once said, he said, you know, it's all been done before. It's all been done before. It's been said before. And that's why we call it research and not search. <laughs> and another, that was an academic. This is an industrial. A good company delivers excellent products and services. A great company does all of this and strives to make the world a better place. So I'd like to finish there. Thank you for your wonderful conference and also exciting subject. Time for one question. Good evening, Professor Sheldon. Uh, congratulations by your lecture. My question is, uh, you said about the importance of uh, high selectivity. Uh, however, uh, high selectivity requires high uh, catalyst ac uh, activity. How is the key? How is the strategy? Well, you need both, of course. You, I mean, if, if your catalyst is very selective, but it's so slow, that, uh, that that's not good either. So you, you have to have the... the the, uh, the combination of high selectivity and high activity, and, and that's what you can get with enzymes. Uh, you, you can, enzymes are, of course, used to being high, highly act, active. The problem is they're not selective with, with the, the uh, substrates that we're giving them because they weren't evolving over a million years to, for those substrates. So we have to re-evolve them, and that can be done. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you again for your wonderful talking and now you need to see the session.